Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. We're very excited to be here today to welcome Cardea and MedCreds to the LFPH family. Uh, they are our two most recent projects announced this week, both in the COVID uh, verification uh, credential side of things. My name is Jenny Wanger. I'm director of programs here at the Linux Foundation Public Health. And um, our, our, our agenda for today, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction on uh, LFPH and what we do, uh, pass it off to Lucy Young uh, from the COVID-19 Credentials Initiative, who will share a little bit more about the story behind how we uh, came across MedCreds and Cardea and what CCI has been doing to advance COVID credentials. And then uh, we'll have some uh, We'll have some background information from both Ken and Tony on how to get involved with their projects and what their projects do. And we'll leave plenty of time at the end for questions. Uh, just so you know, we do have the Q&A feature available. So you can both put your questions there as well as upvote questions from other people. Uh, and uh, this meeting, as with all Linux Foundation meetings is governed by both the LFPH code of conduct as well as the Linux Foundation antitrust policy. I'll be putting links to those in the chat momentarily. Uh, but when you have a chance, please do take a moment to read them and make sure that you are complying with those policies. Um, and with that, a little bit, so Linux Foundation Public Health uh, started as a child of the pandemic. We were really, um, we, we, we started by focusing on exposure notifications and getting that technology out uh, and making sure that it was successful, uh, helping different jurisdictions implement it. From there, we have moved on to uh, COVID credentials, and that's our current area of focus as well, uh, so two areas. And with that, we are uh, making sure that there are open source projects like MedCreds and Cardea available to public health authorities and entities around the world in order for them to be successful. Uh, Linux Foundation Public Health does not do any of the development ourselves, but we do events like this in order to create community and help open source projects uh, become more successful. So uh, a lot of what we do is uh, based in Slack. We've got 1400 members more than that uh, in our community right now, uh, collaborating every day in order to find new areas for public health authorities uh, to help them succeed. We talk with countries and states um, all over and uh, our three current exposure notification apps are used in um, over 12, 13 jurisdictions and then adding in MedCreds and Cardea uh, our numbers uh, in terms of where Linux Foundation open source software is being used uh, by public health uh, to fight the pandemic keeps growing. So we are, uh, I'm really happy to be able to welcome all of you here. And with that, I will pass it off to Lucy to talk about COVID-19 uh, credentials initiative. Thanks, Jenny. Hi, everyone. My name is Lucy Yan. I'm the community director of the, the COVID credentials initiative. and. So it's probably, you, you know, like COVID uh, CCI in short, uh, it was started about a year ago after uh, the pandemic, you know, kind of become very, very serious globally. And so we are, a, we were a global, open global community and we still are after we joined the Linux Foundation Public Health in, in, in late last year. And our mission is to enable the use of open standard based privacy preserving credentials and other related technologies for public health purposes. And, and we, when we were started, we were mainly a group of technologists building on one of, one of standards we're focusing on is that we receive our credentials and they're already working on this standards private COVID and hoping to leverage the, the standard to help combat the global pandemic. That's how we come together. And very luckily we're able to join Linux Foundation Public Health last year so that we were able to not only, you know, you know, still be, you know, be an open global community where people can come and collaborate and share and their experiences and best practices, but also expand our work into, you know, standardization and software implementation. So CCI, now we see ourselves as kind of a, 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 a kind of incubator of ideas and for credential related projects and activities for LPH, you know, starting with COVID, but obviously we want to, you know, gradually expand to other areas of public health. So with that, so give, give you an idea some of the key efforts uh, uh, in standardization we're working on. So our, our um, ecosystem director, oh, missing a word, an ecosystem director, Kalia Young, is, is very, very active in terms of like helping us uh, uh, um, 
uh, on the standardization, leading our standardization effort. So she sits on the, the expert panel of the WHO smart vaccination certificate and contributed it to the WHO interim guidance. And, and one of like the recent effort is the Good House Pass Collaborative, which Kalia is co-chairing uh, the interoperability working group uh, of the, the Good House Pass Collaborative. This is the industry coalition that defines principles and standards for COVID credentials for house passes with a focus on reopening international travel. So what we're, where we're excited uh, to, to, to tell like everyone here that we're the, the first draft of the recommendations of the Good House Pass Collaborative will come out very, very soon. We're hoping and that you know a CCI community and, and we can keep contributing and also our, our open source project can leverage the recommendations and standards that came that came out of there. So so how like CCI, the community are incubating some of the ideas and the projects uh, for, for LPH. So one of the very important and uh, area of work we're doing is through our use case implementation work stream. That's where we welcome projects. You know, like MacRes is one of the, the, the early, MacRes, like uh, Tony is actually uh, the, the kind of co-initiator of CCI and he's been very, very active in, in CCI uh, like throughout like the last year. And, and, and that's how, you know, we, 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 we identify, you know, projects and Tony keep getting involved and keep uh, uh, sharing with the community what, he, what he's working on. And also that's how, you know, one thing leads to another, we find more projects and they come to CCI and, and we serve as a platform where the community can learn about what, what are being implemented in the field and also some of the, like, the ideas are being explored by technologists and, and also by implementers. So by, by having this forum, like it helps us understand what is needed, some of the challenges that like the LPH can help solve through open source. So this is one of the very important venue for us to, to incubate ideas and projects. And another two working groups, one is the rules and governance uh, uh, work, works room, which is very, very important. It, this helps us you know, understand more some of like the, the governance, you know, ethic and even like legal issues that, that are very important to when it comes to implementing COVID credentials. So this group house defines the rules and guidelines by understanding like these challenges and issues for general and particular COVID credential use cases and help develop a minimal viable uh, product for governance frameworks. So when, when the implementers are deploying solutions, they can use as a reference and a template. And, and the last group uh, uh, we have is the vaccine credentials group that emerged uh, earlier this year uh, when, when vaccines are starting more widely distributed and knowing that LPH has a mandate to serve public health and its partners and knowing that vaccine credentials are like the, the area, uh, vaccine distributions and vaccine certificates are the areas governments are, are, are regulating and also governing. So we are hoping to explore how you know in different jurisdictions we can uh, embed credentials mechanism into the existing uh, infrastructure that's how the group is started and also a lot of ideas of how we can help uh, public health authorities are being incubated in in this uh, in this group and also are being discussed at high uh, at lph and see how we can build open source tools for public health so I have attached a, a, a few slides, which we'll be share, uh, share, sharing later with you uh, that get into some of the more uh, community activities. One of the things I want to, to highlight here, so it's the summit series for implementers, that this is like a, 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 a series of events we're organizing at CCI. The core idea is by bringing the current implementers and focusing on particular topics to help us understand uh, like, from the actual like implementers, what are the challenges, right? And also what are like the common areas like each project are, are, are need, need to work on so that we can identify like the public utilities, right? Like the open source, the base components we can develop at LPH. So, uh, and lastly, just in, in terms of open source, what, what is our strategy? As I mentioned, our role, our goal is not, and also as Jenny mentioned, like we're not doing the software implementation, our goal is identifying what are the common pieces, like each application, each implementation needs and providing that minimal viable components, which I've listed a few here for public health authorities and businesses to work with their solution providers to come so that they can contextualize easily, cost effectively without interoperability headaches. So beyond uh, interoperability, we're equally important as interoperability, privacy protection, data and system security, 
equity and, and accessibility are also very, very core, you know, principles and values like we, we have when we're evaluating what projects we want to take in and also how we want to keep helping those projects evolve over time. So with that, I, I want to just very, very quickly uh, introduce uh, the two projects, Cardea and, and Metcred. So Cardia uh, was uh, launched by Indicio Tech and, and provides an easily verifiable, trustworthy, unalterable proof of health test and vaccination a result, a proof, a proof of vaccination that can be shared in a privacy preserving way. And, and Cardia recently announced um, uh, its first reference implementation in partnership with CETA, which works a lot with you know, airports and, and border securities for, uh, uh, for the Aruba government. So, and I will let uh, Ken in, introduce a little more, more how, you know, Cardia can be easily integrated with existing health systems and become the, who are the trust true data sources for credentials and use decentralized identity technology to enable better control of data for individuals. And Metcred, as mentioned, Tony has been, you know, co-initiator of CCI, has been very, very active in the CCI community, leading our, a lot of like uh, efforts. And, and they, in his company, Proof Market, to, uh, developed and contributed MatCrest to LPH and, and, this, and, and the, the core the functionality of the app now like uh, allows uh, medical authorities, uh, you know, for example, like testing labs and hospitals to directly issue tests and vaccination results in form of VARF credentials to individuals in a digital wallet. And uh, the first UK use case of MatCrest uh, is in the film industry, allowing compliance officers to verify workers' COVID test results with their consent before they came on set. I believe Tony will share a lot more, you know, use cases, you know, they're exploring and they're ex implementing. So, so then like now, now let's come to the, the product introductions and demos. So we'll have 30 minutes for both projects. And I will first invite uh, Ken, of, uh, the CTO of Indicio Tech to, to give us introduction and, and a demo. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Lucy. Um... Let me share my desktop here. So um, can you see my screen? Yes. OK, so uh, Cardia is um, our joint effort with the Linux Foundation Public Health uh, Project and in cooperation with CETA to uh, provide um, identity system for uh, managing health credentials in the, in the, uh, across the world. So the motivation behind that is that Indicio is focused on um, digital identity software and growing the identity community. And we work on the decentralized identity architecture. We work with um, the software projects and we do consultancy to help promote that. We provide the expertise to help others understand the how decentralized identity works and how they can incorporate it into their um, their own particular verticals to uh, benefit the, the businesses, the governments, and uh, end users of those systems. Uh, we are strong believers in privacy and security by design. We focus on interoperability and the open source goals uh, of the community, and that's why we got involved and created Cardia. The a uh, recent survey uh, by, done by IATA indicated that 78% of the um, travelers who took part in the survey said that they would only want to use a travel um, credential app if they have full control over their data. So that privacy concern is a strong aspect that um, many of the, um, the travelers today are, are very concerned about. There are also uh, privacy fears about sharing the vaccination data and, the, and those fears are um, becoming a hindrance to adoption. And so if we don't address the privacy and security concerns of the end users, uh, uptake of the technology and its use will be limited. And so we need to make sure that we're taking that into account. Um, digital health credentials allow for um, must be easy to implement and integrate. Otherwise, the um, uplift and the time it takes to get a system in, in, um, in incorporated into an existing system will be too long and take uh, too much effort. 
the interoperability and reliability of the system needs to be there. Otherwise, we'll have a whole bunch of silos that don't um, allow for easy use of the credentials in other applications. Privacy, as I mentioned, is a, a primary concern. Um, there's also a concern from the, the companies who are using this type of data to limit their risk and their data liability. If uh, they're required to have centralized data um, databases of all the data, it provides a target for hackers and uh, exposes the companies to risk by handling PII in, that they don't necessarily want to, to keep. Uh, they'd rather have the end user control their own data and move that liability to the end user. Um, the user control is very important and making sure that we're operating in a way that uh, provides the proper consent and data management principles is also a primary concern. So those are some of the requirements that went into the system. Cardia is, is one of those systems that allows for that. It's an open source scalable solution for COVID. And it, the nice thing is that it can go beyond COVID as well. Eventually COVID will be put under control but there is always the next um, public health issue that will come up. And there are other issues beyond uh, just the public health application that uh, may allow for more secure identity to be created. Once you have an ecosystem like this, it can be used and adapted for other types of uh, uses as well. So that Cardia is the, um, the complete ecosystem that we have developed and it's been contributed to the Linux Foundation Public Health. Um, I will show uh, where the repos are and, and so forth a little bit uh, a little bit later. The, the basic technology operates in a, a very uh, familiar way for those who are familiar with uh, verifiable credentials and the data model that is, was uh, specified by the W3C. Basically, we have the healthcare organization who are the trusted issuers of the health uh, status data, and that's. Uh, uh, put into a credential that is then signed by the, um, the issuer. The, <clears throat> the traveler or the holder of that data has the credential with them and they can present that to whomever they, they choose, when they choose and in the manner that they choose. So the, they can create a connection to a verifier and the verifier can request the data, um, the minimal data required. Selective disclosure can be used to protect pr privacy uh, zero knowledge proofs in some case might be applicable to um, limit the data that's being shared um, to provide the minimum that's required to make a, a good health um, choice on the behalf of a, of a government or a business who needs that information. And the uh, verification can rely on a blockchain based uh, identity network. In, in the case of Cardia, uh, we are based on the Indy network which is uh, an open source project hosted by Hyperledger, also a um, Linux Foundation organization. Uh, the network provides not any particular PII, but only the, the uh, public keys and the schemas and uh, other um, information needed to prove that the credential was indeed signed by the issuer, who is the healthcare um, organization, that it hasn't been tampered with along the way, either maliciously or inadvertently. Um, but the, the data can then be evaluated for making a, a healthcare type determination um, by the governments to say, yes, it is safe for you to come into our country or uh, by a business owner to say, yes, you're, um, you're safe to participate in an activity or enter a business. And so that, that data is, um, that forms the trust basis so that the loose integration based on the verifiable credentials allows for those organizations to uh, safely transmit the data through the user and with the user's consent and control. Um, the agents that are involved in uh, the ecosystem are based on um, the Indy and ARIES projects at Hyperledger. So um, the health enterprise agent who is the source of the trusted data is based on the ARIES cloud agent Python, Akapi with uh, specific UI and uh, controllers to allow for the interaction on the health status credentials that are involved. The, the, that agent issues the health status credential to the holder. In this case, it's a mobile agent based on um, the ARIES Bifold project, 
with custom um, UI and schemas to allow for that interaction to occur around the health uh, status credential. That health status credential is presented to a government agent um, in the initial deployment with CETA and Aruba. This is the, the government of Aruba's agent that takes in that credential, verifies its authenticity, and then makes a decision based on the rules of the health department that uh, if satisfied, the, the traveler is then issued a trusted traveler credential. This uh, allows the traveler uh, who holds that in their mobile agent to then go to many of the venues or uh, places on Aruba to uh, present that to show that they've been cleared and um, uh, satisfied all the health requirements of the health department. Then um, when they present that to the, um, the verifier, uh, at an organization, um, a restaurant, or so, uh, for example, that trusted traveler is the um, credential that's presented, thus preserving the health details uh, to the holder and not having to reveal that in particular. The, the government needs to see those health details, but a restaurant and the, the um, person at the gate of, the, of a, a tourist um, venue does not need to see the exact details of, of the health stuff that went on. They only need to know that the government has evaluated that and they can trust the government's evaluation and, and therefore either let somebody in or not. The uh, Hyperledger Indie network that we anchored this to was the Indicio network. We chose that one because it is a professionally maintained network with uh, staff to make sure that it's operating correctly and is um, uh, kept up to date and is fully operational. So those are the kind of the components that were involved. The, uh, um, the benefit of that is that the user is always uh, in control of their data and they're consenting. There is some uh, optional uh, ability for them to pre-configure um, sharing. So they may say, if somebody wants to see my trusted traveler credential, I'll automatically share that. I'll consent to that once and um, have that pre-configured so that my agent on my behalf will um, share that without having to prompt me every single time. There, are, uh, It's also set up so that the, the user could, if they wanted to, uh, determine and offer consent each time that, that uh, something's going to be shared. This will uh, speed up the reopening of, of travel and, uh, and particular venues that need to have large groups of people together so they can do that in a safe way. And since this incorporates security um, uh, with privacy by design, we're using those digital records to um, give tamper evident um, uh, sharing of the data so that the, the trust that the, the relying governments and businesses make uh, when they make their decisions can be based on that, that uh, uh, highly available um, uh, cryptography to allow for them to, to know that the data can be trusted. The Cardia scales um, to millions of participants because the ledger writes are very minimal. You're typically writing the, the keys of the, the public keys of the issuers. The schemas are written once and shared by uh, all of the different issuers and verifiers. And um, the, the it's not in a centralized database that needs to be read uh, or accessed in order to do verifications. The verifications are, um, the data is distributed to each user. So there's no centralized database with uh, the burden of trying to process all of the requests. It's a, a fully distributed system. And uh, to, at this point, we've uh, looked at uh, the digitized health information only. We've not done anything with paper credentials to, um, uh, uh, deal with the uh, uh, low, lower tech solution yet. So this was successfully trialed in um, uh, in Aruba with uh, CETA's leadership and cooperation and uh, coordination of that effort um, to share the uh, the uh, digital um, uh, health status credentials with. Uh, the governments and um, venues that were involved in the trial.
think I have the right link here for the video. There we go. So that's a quick uh, demonstration of uh, the concepts that are involved there. Uh, a couple more uh, quick things, and then we'll turn some time back over to Tony. But uh, the once the ecosystem is written and there's some reference agents available, there is a network uh, upon which it's built. There's two sides of it, the technical side and the business side. And it's important to, to address both pieces of that. There is a, a solid network to build on. The agents that we built on, it builds on the shoulders of other open source communities and the contributions that they continue to make there will be incorporated in Cardia as it rolls forward. Getting those applications uh, tailored to the, the use case that we're looking for and, and uh, deploying an ecosystem. CETA is uh, working to uh, make this, um, to carry this forward and continuing to uh, expand their, um, what they're doing with what they learned in the, the trial and uh, to how that might be applicable to other uh, governments and airports and airlines throughout the world. On the business side, the governance for the network is well established and in, on the Indicio network. The architecture and design is, is fairly solid. UI and UX, we spent some time customizing that. There's more work to be done there. And that will need to be tailored for indiv individual organizations to make sure that it is uh, um, providing the best user experience for each uh, particular vertical or application. And then the, the governance, marketing, and business strategy around a product. If you have great tech and you haven't figured out how to communicate that to the rest of the world, um, that's a, a mousetrap with no one who wants to buy it. So we need to make sure that we have successful launches. Uh, last thing I want to show are the kind of how to get involved. There is, um, in addition to our weekly meeting that's held 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time um, every Thursday. This week, we will be having a discussion um, where um, Kalia has uh, helped us coordinate to, to invite Paul Knowles to talk about schemas. And so 
uh, involving those uh, good health pasture initiatives or other organizations that are setting standards. Um, that's something that at Cardia we want to incorporate. We're not a standards organization. We are a consumer of standards. And so we want to participate in this and contribute to the standards, but we're not the standards organization. We're a doer project. We do, we iterate and uh, improve the project over time. Um, this is our main repo, the Cardia project. This is a Linux Foundation um, public health uh, repo where the pr main project is hosted. Uh, within that, there are multiple repos, one for the overall documentation of the project and then uh, code repos. Not all of the code has been open source yet. We're still in the process of migrating some of the other repos and, and they will be um, um, available under the same organization here. Um, within each repo, it's um, applicable that you um, anyone can create issues and uh, raise uh, particular topics of concern or uh, suggestions for improvement. The uh, pull requests are open from everybody as long as they're following the contributor guidelines from the Linux Foundation um, that they're willing to contribute under those IP guidelines that we welcome everybody to participate and help improve the overall project and move it forward and, and as, it, as it grows and matures. I, I think that's all I, I had to present today. Um, are, there, are there questions or do you wanna uh, go through Tony's presentation and do all questions at the end? Yeah, can let's, uh, so if, if any kind of uh, questions you can address in the chat, like the responding to it, if you, if you can't, we can leave it for the, for the later, the, the Q&A part. I'll let Tony. Tony, the CEO and founder of Proof Market to introduce Matt Kress. Thanks, Ken. And Tony, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ken. <clears throat> Thank you, Lucy. Um, yeah, it's a privilege to be here. We're honored to uh, contribute uh, the MedCreds platform uh, to Linux Foundation Public Health. Um, just a bit of my background where how we got here prior to discovering digital identity about three years ago in the SSI community. I was head of product at a company called Vantiv, which at the time was the largest payment processor in the US by processing volume. And I was in charge of uh, digital wallets. And um, in the 20, you know, 2014, 15, 16 era, what that meant effectively was payments. And it really was all about Apple Pay. But there was Apple Pay, Android Pay, Samsung Pay, MasterCard, MasterPass, Amex Express Checkout, and all these ways to, uh, in a contactless manner or without compromising your credit card number, uh, make a payment. And so when we came across SSI, we thought, wow, this is really going to be the future of not only payments, but any number of interactions you have on a day-to-day on -day basis <clears throat> where the convenience of having your data with you uh, would improve any number of different kinds of experiences you'd have, <clears throat> whether it's, you know, commercial, uh, you know, security, going to an event, et cetera. So um, we started Proof Market, and let me just share my screen, really because uh, the tools to develop UX for um, digital identity became available. Um, you know, companies like Evernim. Now, which, do you guys see my whole screen there? Yes, Tony. Okay, okay. So, um, you know, our initial in January 2020 use case was, uh, the um, sustainable agriculture and food producers and helping them prove the, the quality of their food production process. We had started building a team and when the COVID pandemic started to arrive, um, you know, we pivoted to, to med creds and we really think of the big picture as Stripe for identity. And if you're not familiar with Stripe, you probably use it every time you get an Uber or Lyft ride. It gives you that magical experience of payments when you are hopping out of the car. So it's, it's things like that we envision that Proof Market will empower. And with uh, the contribution of MedCreds to Linux Foundation, we're now developing our, our own product, Engage, which is powered by MedCreds. So uh, that's something to announce today. Um, a bit of background, as Lucy mentioned, we're one of the co-founders of the COVID Credentials Initiative. Originally, that started as a a website called fightthevirus.world that Gary DeBeer um, came up with and quickly turned into this community. Uh, over the past year, we developed the MedCreds platform. Um, most of this year, we've really been focused on extending digital credentials into the paper realm and you know, helping to facilitate 
ways that you can provide the same kinds of privacy by design features functionality to individuals uh, on paper. Um, and then over the last several months, it's been a lot of work within the Good Health Pass collaborative, uh, convening a big tent of everyone that's looking to help solve the, the pandemic related use cases and uh, coalesce all those efforts into one framework that can allow for interoperability and uh, adoption. Just a bit of, of the journey, everything that's that's gone on that got us to this point, um, kind of touched on uh, you know, initiating COVID credentials initiative. One other thing that we worked on last year was introducing legislation in California, um, authorizing verifiable credentials for COVID test results and other medical test results. Uh, we, we made that all the way to the governor's desk. Um, I do think it's unfortunate that did not pass in California because the same time the governor vetoed this legislation, he authorized 150,000 daily COVID tests. And during this period of time, the film industry in California was able to stay open because they were doing daily testing of their cast and crew. Now, while you were having a film production company open in business, across the street, restaurants, coffee shops, hair salons were forced to be closed. Now imagine if a person could walk across the street, show their test result and get lunch at the local business. Uh, that would have been awesome, but unfortunately uh, the world wasn't quite ready for, for verifiable credentials at that point in time. Uh, we spent uh, most of last summer doing user trials. Uh, early in the summer in a June, July timeframe, we were working with Dr. Brent Blue in Wyoming. Uh, he was one of the first uh, physicians to offer antibody testing for anyone that wanted that, and we were providing the resulting there. Um, we worked with Dr. Ben Littlejohn in uh, California with some film production use cases, and this is where we learned that um, COVID testing in the U.S. was never going to be what it needed to be. We ran into numerous challenges trying to get cast and crew uh, tested through their physicians, and if you recall back in uh, July, August timeframe, it was sometimes taking five, six days to get a COVID test back. So uh, we learned a lot. We developed, uh, you know, a lot of improvements in the user experience and the functionality. Unfortunately, it was very challenging to scale that at the time, just simply because COVID testing was not available. We moved on and spent the remainder of last year from August through really January on UX improvements, bug fixes, application hardening. And so the, the code that we're contributing, uh, we estimate is, is around one to one and a half million dollars worth of collective effort from a team that has uh, put a lot of, let's say blood, sweat and tears into uh, bringing this to life. <clears throat> High level, uh, the MedCreds platform has a doctor portal and API for uh, you know, we like to call these systems of record. This is where, you know, the data originates and these are also known as issuers. Uh, there's a portal for, um, you know, managing patients, uh, creating new appointments and issuing new test results. This can be driven by an API for labs to do, to do this. Uh, we support multiple credentials. So as Ken was referring to earlier, uh, the COVID, the um, Good Health Pass is standardizing the credential schemas. So we'll be adding those in as soon as the uh, Good Health Pass uh, reference, reference a document is complete. Uh, we, we offer a you know, simple trust registry. This is where you have the list of, folk, of organizations that are trusted to be issuers of credentials, as well as trusted verifiers. Not, not necessarily do you want anyone to be a verifier. And so with uh, the existing MedCreds application, uh, you can onboard trusted issuers, trusted verifiers, assign DIDs and public-private key pairs um, to them. Uh, there's also a fairly robust roles-based authorization. So for example, if you have an issuer account, you can have one or many physicians or doctors, as well as admins to uh, maintain the patient registry. Similarly on the verifiers, uh, imagine we built this for the film industry and you would have a COVID compliance officer who is responsible for one or many groups of individuals and this same basic design can work if it's a school district or an airport or a business where you have someone responsible for a given population. We aim to be the gold standard for the Good Health Pass. And this is a big part of the reason that we contributed the code to uh, Linux Foundation to help uh, 
progress uh, this, this goal. Um, we also spend a lot of time, as mentioned, on the paper credentials, working with the, the MIT Path Check Foundation. And a big part of our future roadmap is to uh, bring these together. So under one uh, code base, you can support digital and paper uh, for everyone. I'm going to talk about real quickly just the Good Health Pass. I think it's important to align conceptual frameworks. And this is a lot of the effort that has gone down within the Good Health Pass Collaborative at Trust Over IP. Uh, it's important to know what you're talking about because privacy by design, a cryptographic proof, a self sovereign identity, uh, health passports, there's a lot of language that people use to talk about. Uh, what what this is and getting aligned on what is an attestation. Uh, this is something that you can say about yourself. A certificate is something that uh, can be uh, verified in some manner. Uh, this issue by someone. Uh, credential, you know, as the ability to be portable to the individual. And then the pass is the real uh, key new addition, which enables that person to do a share of that information that's a way in a way that's privacy preserving, whether it's using a zero knowledge proof or whether there's data minimized for the use case. Uh, the, the pass is a key concept that goes well beyond uh, COVID use cases and travel use case. This is uh, you know, important in any, any kind of uh, identity, digital identity use case. You can imagine uh, minimizing data, you know, zero knowledge proofing uh, for what the verifier needs to make that decision. The Good Health Pass is a big tent, as I mentioned. It has been constructed to be inclusive of all the other efforts out there and to provide roadmaps. So whether it's the EU Green Pass, the WHO certificate, the VCI initiative, or any others, uh, we can have roadmaps or provide privacy filters. So everyone that's using whatever system they start with, whatever credential, whatever certificate, uh, they can get the, the benefit of a privacy filter, which ultimately is what the Good Health Pass uh, initiative is, is driving towards. This slide here is, is the big picture. So, you know, big picture identity uh, and in green is what MedCreds currently supports. And so while MedCreds at Linux Foundation Public Health, the roadmap will likely move towards things like uh, comprehensive immunization, uh, um, emergency contact 2.0 and other, other kinds of healthcare credential use cases. There's a lot of other things that fall into this framework. The reason I put this slide here is just, it, it can be fairly difficult to understand how all these pieces fit together. And everyone is pretty comfortable with uh, hopefully the trust, the trust triangle, right? So, um, but you know, if you sort of enumerate, you know, what, what is in each of these triangles? So, you know, let's just talk to the issuer side real quick. So on the issuer side, MedCreds has an API and a portal, and we issue credentials that are signed by DIDs. Now it's possible to issue credentials that are using public key uh, cryptography or other kinds of custom ways to digitally sign um, these, these credentials if they're non-W3C or, or just customized. Um, and going one step outside, there's always a system of record involved. And especially when you're dealing with legacy infrastructure, you may need to connect to a database. You may need to have a person review something and do that issuing process. And so getting the system of record, which in the COVID use case at MedCred is testing labs, it's electronic healthcare record systems, it's physicians, they need to be in, inside of a trust registry and have permission to do the issuing process. And so if you sort of expand out what, what kinds of other things can this framework support, you know, licensing, education, uh, merchant payments, financial institutions, your credit score, your social graph, insurance, and many other things follow this model. And then you can see how, you know, with this technology advancing beyond healthcare credentials, the kinds of things you can give an individual to uh, move about their daily life and, and be the center of their data versus, um, you know, an object of their data. On, on this side, uh, the verifiers. Um, generally, there's going to be, and I'm going to I'm going to focus in a little bit on on the the travel use case. If you're looking to travel from you know a country of origin to a destination, it's the destination country that sets the policy that governs whether you're uh, arriving um, in compliance. And so the, these these policies need to be put into some form of a digital. Uh, form, whether that's a rules engine in the travel, there's 
uh, things such as thematic and ICTS. Um, within healthcare, there's uh, clinical decision supports, and there's a lot of different technology out there that looks at data and, de and makes determinations and decisions based upon rules and policies. It's the verifier in this inner circle here, which is the self-sovereign identity component. So the verifier evaluates the credential against the policy and the rules and makes a decision. And the key thing with SSI and credentials is the verifier is able to check that the information they're making the decision on came from a reliable source without compromising privacy, without reaching out to the issuer directly and letting your doctor know where you're going, et cetera. So, you know, the, the risk of correlation of data and all of these privacy concerns uh, are, are solved with this, you know, decentralized trust registry framework. A bit about the roadmap. So I, I, I will share a video for the comprehensive uh, MedCreds demo. We have been building this on the open standards um, for over a year. We're pretty close already to what Good Health Pass has been talking about and to continue to develop the MedCreds platform to be a Good Health Pass reference implementation. Uh, these are the next steps we're looking at. So it's that vaccination credential schema, is the test result credential schema, it's enhancements to the trust registry so that we can support verification of credentials that come from other uh, networks or other uh, sources where they're not issued by the MedCreds network. Um, this network of networks concept that trust over IP is, um, really that's why trust over IP was, was, uh, was stood up, was to take the SSI concept and move it to a network of networks concepts because there will be, there will be no one network to rule them all. We happen to run on Sovereign and there's many other networks. Uh, Cardea is running on um, another different one. Sorry, can I just, I just spaced out on the name of that. <laughs> um, so, so just moving on. So um, these are really the three main components to have MedCreds be a good health pass uh, reference implementation is the trust registry and it's the credential schemas. Otherwise the platform more or less does everything the good health pass uh, uh, interoperability blueprint is talking about. Um, you know, one there's always the rules engine as well. I forgot to mention, and paper credentials. Uh, the list can probably continue on forever. Um, I, I do want to talk about things beyond COVID use cases because COVID will eventually get under control, hopefully sooner rather than later. And the things that are really exciting about uh, healthcare credentials that I get excited about are what can you do beyond your test result for COVID and your COVID vaccine credential, right? So we've all probably been through, if you're a parent, that experience of trying to get your kids into school and um, showing them their, their immunizations. Uh, there's, in case of emergency 2.0, I, I think, um, you know, health wallets and giving you your information, there's, there's ways that you can, um, with zero knowledge or data minimization, share your health information. This list here comes from our, our uh, medical advisory board. And uh, we, we talked this through, and th these are the ones that are seem to be low hanging fruit in terms of enhancements to the way the, at least in the US, the healthcare system with the EHR systems already work and things that can really help healthcare providers, um, you know, that, that aren't already covered. So. A unified allergy list, uh, just maintaining that in case someone, you find someone that is having a reaction and they can easily, you know, show that in a way that's verifiable. A big one that uh, was recommended is a reconciled medication list. It, in having a record that's maintained of all the, all the medication you're currently taking is, is a big problem and it's, it's unresolved because just the fragmented nature of our healthcare system. Um, and then new patient onboarding. I, I don't know about you guys, but every time I go to the doctor, it seems like it's a new doctor and I'm filling out these same forms over and over and over. So wouldn't it be easy to tap and, you know, onboard as a new patient. So this slide just, you know, again, what, what's beyond COVID? Um, we, we have med creds, we're contributing it. We're gonna build the good health pass standard and make that available for global travel. But, you know, beyond that with this infrastructure, and I like to talk about the first ever standards-based digital identity rail. Um, in the payments world, we talk about payments rails and the payments rails, 
you know, across the world are largely uh, MasterCard, Amex, Visa, and Discover. And there's, you know, payment can happen anywhere. With the uh, vaccine and test result credential, we're going to see the deployment for the first time of a standards-based interoperable identity rail. And it's really exciting the kinds of things that will be possible after that. It's, uh, you know, one of the silver linings of COVID is that the SSI uh, technology community has really come together and uh, pushed forward this uh, technology. I think we've gained easily two to three years uh, of uh, development that, you know, without a, the pandemic, unfortunately, um, would otherwise not, not have moved so quickly. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, with that, um, let me thank you for your time. I will uh, post a, a video. Um, I guess I should talk about the community. So best way to get involved, come into the Linux Foundation Slack, um, look for the MedCreds channels. Uh, we have a community meeting every uh, Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific, um, primarily over the next period of time we'll be focusing on you know what is the delta between uh, the current MedCreds uh, platform and uh, the Good Health Pass reference implementation guidelines and uh, getting that developed. So I will share a link here. Um, we'll stop sharing and leave some time for a Q&A. Well, th thanks, Tony. So, yeah, uh, yeah. For for those of you who want to look at the demo, uh, Tony shared the link. And yeah, I think we, you know, we have five minutes left. Uh, normally, it has to go longer than expected. But yeah, let's get to the questions. Uh, I think there are five questions for for Ken. The first five questions. So, Ken, if you and, and one question for Tony. Ken, do you mind starting uh, with the the questions and the question Q and A panel? Oh, okay. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong tab. Yeah, there's a. Sure. Um, what wallet are we using? Uh, the wallet we use is based on Bifold, which is an Aries project, an open source wallet. Um, anybody can contribute to that wallet or use that wallet. Uh, we're using the JSON form that's supported by Indy right now. There's some efforts in, uh, in progress to adopt JSON LD and EBS plus type signatures within the ARIES community. As that happens, we'll be able to benefit from the um, upstream uh, benefit. Um, Lucy, you mentioned in my private chat, most people don't know SSI or trust over IP. I'm sure very few people know JSON LD BBS plus signatures, but that's the future. What it means is that you can do things like prove you're over 21 without giving up your uh, date of birth. So currently, Indy supports ZKP style Kamenish Latenskia uh, signatures, which are a ZKP is zero knowledge signature. The signature style is represented in JSON. JSON is a very flat architecture currently inside that Indy world. So Tony's mentioned that uh, BBS Plus is a new type of signature. It's got better performance and the same security benefits as ZKP, the current Kamenish Latenskia signatures only smaller signature representation, a little bit faster performance, and they're working on getting predicate proofs added to it. Uh, more details, go talk to the, the cryptographers in the URSA community and they'll give you all the details you wanna know and a little bit more. Um, the representation, whether it's JSON or JSON-LD, the data model uh, specified by the W3C is a data model and it doesn't, it, it uses as a standard representation as examples JSON LD, which is a linked data thing that's a, a little easier to use and more dynamic. The older JSON representation is also valid. There's also uh, communities looking at CBOR and other representations, but the, that data model moving towards JSON LD will inter increase interoperability between all solutions. And so that's a good thing and look forward to using that. I think Tony's on the same mindset on that. Yeah, Tony? 100%, I think resolving the signature question that had been, in, let's just say, um, argued over for many years, potentially. Uh, resolving that this year, um, I think is a huge plus for the industry and in helping us move forward towards interop. Uh, next question is about webhook notifications inside the Python agent. Uh, there are a couple of different security models to, uh, to account for that. In some of the work that we've done, we've done simple OAuth 
kind of things, but it's very flexible. So many different representations are possible for securing your APIs. Um, the pre-aggregated -aggreg verifiable credential uh, simplified vaccination status. Um, right now we're using uh, vaccination records that are typical of those collected by state uh, health, public health officials and uh, HIEs for communication of those records. We take a subset of that data that, that is useful in the sharing a credential among, uh, among different parties. It doesn't have every single detail because most of the records that we've discovered as we looked at the HIE type records and the uh, public health records, they're not fully populated either. And so we look at the fields that are of most use and make sure that we're trying to focus on the ones that are um, uh, currently being collected and distributed. We're uh, also looking to migrate our, our uh, schemas to be in line with the good health pass recommendations or others who are who put more um, effort into trying to create a worldwide standard for that. So um, that's the, the, the mechanism there. The, the vaccination records, we don't try to aggregate the vaccination record. We try to provide enough base information such as the same type that would be uh, collected and uh, prepared in the medical community. We don't do anything funky with that. The only interesting thing we do is we take whatever medical records you have, apply whatever rules in the, in the machine readable governance, so it's very flexible to determine, make a health determination before is issuing a trusted traveler or you know, good health pass type of, of credential. So we follow that same mechanism that the good health pass is recommending um, and try not to, to get too uh, uh, fancy on uh, transforming the data. We try to use the data as it exists in the medical world and take the useful subset of that data. Another one on paper credentials, we do not have a paper credential um, uh, mechanism built in yet. Uh, that's something to consider for the future. So um, the wallet that we are using is in the process of being open source. So parts of the, of the code are completely open source now and other parts, the wallet itself is open source. The, the particular workflows are being open sourced as we remove um, specifics from the source of that code from CETA's um, repos and, and make it into a generic uh, form that can be um, not having any proprietary logos or any um, implications for the IP to be able to have that in a, in a form. And that's in the, the parts that are open source now are available and you can look at them, they're in the repos and there are other repos uh, that are coming as well to add a, the complete picture. The MedCards wallet is based on Aries.net framework, and it's running on top of Trinsic's implementation of that. Uh, Trinsic will be helping to support a documentation for how to take MedCreds and run it on Aries natively, um, or you can download MedCreds and run it on Trinsic. Up to you. And Tony, does that um, do is it compatible with the IATA wallet, which I know is also in the uh, yes, so uh, Trinsic and Evernim. So Evernim is the uh, provider of the IATA solution. We runs on Trinsic. They do use the same, same tech stack. Um, so theoretically, they should be interoperable. We should do some testing. Also, just to touch on paper creds, uh, we did develop the paper cred standard with MIT PathCheck, which is the foundation of what the Good Health Pass implementation is. So we do plan to support paper credentials. Cool, thank you. We're already like two minutes over. Thanks very much uh, to uh, Ken and Tony to share about your projects. And, and so we will share uh, the recording and, and also like the, the slides I use for the introduction. And, and also I will ask Tony and Ken if they can share the slides as well. But yeah, we, we will follow up with, uh, with recording and also in the, in the slides, the introduction slides, you will find more information about LPH and CCI. And you know, I'll add the links of the ripples of the two projects in there so you also ha have that. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And yeah, we hope to see you, you know, uh, your, your activities in CCI, PH, and also in the two projects. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Lucy. Good to see you, Ken. Thank you. Bye.